It's a great pleasure. My blessed man, Gary Gilly, Kavrinochi, and Marianne Constantine. She's a professor at the Advanced Centre for Wales and Celtic Studies and works on Romantic Era Welsh literature in both Welsh and English in the broadest sense. She's written on subjects such as romantic forgeries, travel writing, and with David Johnson, who I see is just. Um, uh, come into the conference via Zoom. Uh, she's the general editor of a series of 10 volumes which bring together a range of responses to the turbulent 1790s in Welsh and English, including printed ballads, letters, newspaper articles, poetry, pamphlets and sermons. And today she'll be talking about that revolutionary decade and Welsh voices in Paris. Croeso Mawrthi, Marianne. Diolch chi, diolch yn fawr, a diolch chi bawb am bod bore yma. A neis gweld, well, dim gweld, pobl wer a screen hefyd. Um, thanks so much to Anthony and Marion for setting the tone this morning. I'm tempted to say, and now for something completely different, it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. It's going to be, feel a bit like one of those open-top buses where people just point things out very, very quickly as they zoom past. So it'll feel more superficial, but there'll be kind of plenty of action, I think. OK, so, um, Rina Sata. So the work I want to talk about today stems from the project that you just mentioned, um, which was a project which ran for four years at the Centre for Advanced Welsh and Celtic Studies in Aberystwyth on responses from Wales to the French Revolution. And I had an amazing team of colleagues of whom Marianne Loeffler was a linchpin in the entire project. And as I said, people will probably know um, Paul Frames, volume on Richard Price, but also Marianne's uh, political pamphlets and sermons and her press and public discourse on which her paper um, drew just now. Most of the things that came out of the project were anthologies, and each one took a different genre, so poetry in Welsh or in English, printed ballads, journals, newspapers, letters and sermons, because we wanted to see how genre reflected what you could and couldn't say about certain political discourses. And I think that was a very interesting um, way to do it. But what it meant was that the focus shifted away from people. I think the history of the French Revolution in Wales has been very, very people-centered. So it's a sort of a list of names, what they thought, and how those ideas got passed down. I wanted to break that up by focusing on genre in the project. And kind of as a result, people have come back to bite me. So um, what I'm talking about today is stories of individuals who responded in different ways to the revolution, but in Paris itself. And I'm afraid I have done no new research for this conference, except to reflect a little bit on what could still be done with all this amazing material. So the stories from Paris then reveal some of the historical and social factors that caused people to engage directly with the events in France. And they do offer a series of snapshots of the French Revolution in progress over the decade between 1789 and 1798. Okay, Irene Quintin. As we know, Richard Price had several Paris-based contacts in the late 1780s, among them, of course, the American ambassador Thomas Jefferson, of whom we've heard Patrick Sparrow speak, and the Comte de Mirabeau and many others. In July 1789, however, he gained a new informant, his own nephew, George Cadogan Morgan. Born in Bridgend in 1754, Morgan attended Cowbridge Grammar School and then briefly Jesus College before studying maths and science at the Hoxton Academy. In the late 1770s, he preached in Norwich and Great Yarmouth, and he married into the influential dissenting family of shipping merchants, the Hurries. And I know that there's been new work done on the Hurry family letters. The Morgans then moved to Hackney, and George Cadogan worked closely with Richard Price, lecturing at the new college. And then in the summer of 1789, in the company of three friends, he set off on a tour which followed a beaten tourist route and was to some extent a grand tour with two younger men, straight down through France to Calais, Paris, Marseille, Geneva, and then the Alps. And he kept a record of his impressions in a series of letters to his wife, and also in two lengthy and really important letters to Richard Price. So the letters to his wife survived and were rediscovered in the Newbury Library by the tenacious Paul Frame, uh, which we then edited and published in our 2012 volume. 
that those two crucial letters to Price written from Paris at the height of the uprising, key phrases of which informed Price's discourse on the love of our country, those letters have vanished, as have every single copy of the London Gazetteer in which they were reproduced in August and September that year. Uh, this is one of the great losses, I think, of the, the revolutionary period and, again, may feed into why Price is not remembered in certain ways later on. Morgan and his companions reached Paris on the evening of the 7th of July. And when they left, not without a certain amount of difficulty, on the 19th, they had, just to name a few things, attended a meeting of the National Assembly at Versailles. They had been at the theater the night that Necker was dismissed. They witnessed everything kick off in the Palais Royal and the explosion of angry crowds onto the streets on the night of the 13th. They saw the formal dismantling of the Bastille and they watched the king enter the city without his guards and accept, somewhat reluctantly, the cockade of the new order. By a stroke of fortune, they were based at the very expensive Grand Hotel du Palais Royal, literally overlooking the square where everything started. However, wrote George, we have not grudged the money as our situation at the awful moment of revolt enabled us to see what others who lodged in a different part of the town heard from us with astonishment. The most dramatic letter written from the hotel at four o'clock in the morning of the 13th of July vividly captures the boiling and unsettled state of commotion in the narrow streets below. Our company, wrote Morgan, partook of the hurry and terrors of the crowd. Once more, we lodged ourselves safely in our citadel. It was now night, and we could only hear the steps and shouts of those who passed to and fro. The sky was red with several fires. We could hear the reports of the guns from a variety of quarters, and we witnessed the cries of mothers and wives who stuck to their husbands and sons, pressing them not to unite with the general rage. About 10 o'clock, the uniformity of the noise was interrupted by the violence of a party who assailed the doors of a gunsmith living in a room just under ours. The crash of the stones and stakes which the populace drove against the doors set our whole hotel into an uproar. Fortunately, finding no guns in the shop below, the crowd retired in great tranquility and left the agitated guests in peace. Morgan is an excellent reporter. He's vivid, persuasive, and given the chaos he's describing, he's surprisingly calm-headed. He has an endearing knack, too, of putting his own personal inconvenience into a greater historical perspective. And I think this is what interests me most about these people in Paris. Their sense, very clear sense, that what they are experiencing is <coughs> history. How many of us um, feel at times that we're at great historical moments and fail to somehow grasp you know, how to describe that? So he's, he's very aware that what he's writing about is something which will be important. At various points on the journey, the group find themselves in threatening situations. So when they attempt to leave the city a couple of times, they're turned back amidst taunts, hissings, abuse, and insults to our own lodging, where they searched every rag of our baggage and treated us in every respect as if we had been spies. Just beyond Dijon, when they do get out, the traces of their carriage are cut, uh, leaving the carriage immovable and altogether at the mercy of the crowd. And every time, it is their enthusiasm for the progress of liberty with a capital L which carries them through these difficult moments. They are able to see what is happening and where this surge of, of popular revolt is coming from. So Morgan then is acutely aware that he's witnessing something significant and that it is a privilege to see it at first hand. When he wrote, when he finally left Paris, he wrote, the king's entrance without his guards into Paris, the demolition of the Bastille, and the restoration of peace and liberty to the noble Parisians amply repaid our loss of time and the fatigue of our spirits. Not that many British travelers abroad who can be that generous when they have problems with border control, etc. <laughs> On the 2nd of August, um, 1789, Price wrote in his journal, my nephew, George, has been witness at Paris to the glorious scene. 
He has seen all the events that have attended the revolution in the great kingdom that now astonishes Europe, that has scarcely a parallel in the history of the world, and that is likely to be the commencement of a general reformation of the governments of Europe. Heaven grant that it may be settled without much more bloodshed. I'm always glad that Price did not live to see the bloodiest phase of the revolution. And I'm always deeply saddened that the intelligent, scientific, and humane George Cadogan would die aged 44 in 1798, leaving his large family to make an arduous journey and a new life across the Atlantic. An expression, if you like, of how the Price family did eventually come to become American. And that story is brilliantly told by Paul in the second half of, of the book here. So I'm going to move on now to talk about other people. And um, there'll be less about Price. But it's bringing up many of the people that Marianne has referenced this morning. So the year that Price died in 1791, another Glamorgan man found himself in France. This was the Baptist minister and millenarian Morgan John Treese of Flanbradach, who'd spent the years 1787 to 91 ministering in Pontypool. In August 17, this is such a good story. In August 1791, he was on board a ship bound for Exeter to go on holiday for his health to Devon. Right? Nice holiday in Devon. The wind changed, and he ended up providentially, as he interpreted it, in Calais. His mission then became, as Howell Davis has brilliantly put it, a Protestant crusade to preach the gospel and disseminate civil and religious liberty among the French papists. So in two reflective autobiographical letters to a fellow Baptist, written in November 1791 and February 1792, we learn a little bit about the course of Fries's life as he saw it and glean something about his experiences across the channel. He spoke no French, but nothing daunted, began to preach in Calais and Dunkirk to an assortment of expats and some English-speaking natives. And of course, by this time, organized religion in France was in a curious state of vacuum. Church property had been nationalized since November 1789, and Sir Fries was able to rent a former Catholic church to preach his Baptist gospel. Little wonder that the revolution felt like part of God's plan for humanity. He ends up in Paris. And by February 1792, his address is chez uh, Monsieur Gamble at the corner of Rue Louis Le Grand, a street which is about to re be renamed rather less monarchically the Rue des Piques, the Street of Pikes. So the renaming of the street, I think, captures as well as anything the extraordinary flux and contingency of life in Paris at this period. But it's that tiny little detail of the address which gives us a crucial clue. The host was James Gamble, a printer and engraver who would be one of the signatories to an address drawn up by the members of the radical British and Irish community during a dinner at White's Hotel, which was the kind of hangout for British radicals in Paris during this period. A British and Irish, I should say. The address, written by these people, congratulates the French government on their commitment to universal rights and looks forward to the formation of a close union between the French Republic and the English, Scotch, and Irish nations. And of course, one of the things is that Wales is always invisible in these discourses because it has no state, no kind of uh, official recognition. So Welshness in any historical discourse from this period is something that has to be unpicked by strand by strand by strand at a micro level, much in the way that we saw Marion's paper do earlier today. Among the those present at the writing of this address were notable radical figures such as Tom Paine, Lord Edward Fitzgerald, John Hereford Stone, and John Frost. So Morgan John Rees's connection with James Gamble raises the possibility that he was at least peripherally involved with this radical network. Frustratingly, though, 
He tells us nothing about the circles that he moved in during his stay in Paris. And this is because these letters written to a fellow Baptist are as much concerned with his inner journey, his spiritual journey, as with the externals of the world he finds himself in. Yet, towards the end of his second letter, written in a city under snow and sporadically erupting into food riots, Fries lays out four possible futures. I think I've got a PowerPoint for this. You'll naturally inquire something about the signs of the times. It is best, perhaps, to be silent. Everything is quiet at present, but disturbances are expected. In regard to politics, which is the general topic of, com topic of conversation, the nation is divided into four classes, some for preserving the present constitution as it is, others for having two chambers, as in England, others for the old monarchical government, and the fourth for reform of the constitution and making it consistent with itself, as they say, by taking away all vetoes and even kings out of the way. If the first will not stand, it is very probable the last will make a bold attempt if they happen to meet with an Oliver to lead them. History in the making is painfully tangible here. And that, again, I think is interesting. So where George Cadogan was kind of fully in the moment, Morgan John Rees believes in predestination and believes that the course of history has been mapped out. What, says he, need we trouble ourselves about these things? It is the Lord omnipotent that reigneth, and his will shall stand. And yet, he absolutely can't help himself because he really is a man of action. When each work is going forward, we cannot be altogether idle spectators. The danger is in gazing so much as to forget the one thing needful. So I think that's a really interesting approach to how you become an activist when you think that everything is already mapped out. The period in France seems to have ended in disappointment, but Rhys remained as energetic as ever. On returning to Wales, he set about writing for, editing, and publishing the first ever Welsh language periodical, A Cylchgrawn Cymraeg, the first instalment of which appeared in February 1793. Through it, as Marianne has shown, he gave voice to his own thoughts on class privilege, oppressive taxes, war, the slave trade, the missionary movement, disestablishment, education, parliamentary reform, but not Richard Price. And the worsening political climate meant that by October 1794, he had emigrated to America, where he traveled widely, preaching in the South against slavery and in favor of religious liberty. In 1798, he bought a large swathe of land in the Allegheny Mountains and christened it Cambria. He too died aged only 44 in 1804. Rees's journal, in from the period of his travels in the South, refers back occasionally to his time in Paris. And that moment in early 1792 is evoked um, brilliantly here, I think. Having stood on the ruins of the Bastille in Paris and still feeling the energy of those principles which shake Europe to the center, I am now constrained to preach liberty to captives and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So here, the actual physical, the physicality of having been in the Bastille is what carries him forward across the world um, with that energy still inside him. And this brings us to my next story, so next stop on the bus. Um, two men who were anything but idle spectators whose involvement in events in France a few months after Rhys left could potentially have produced a different sequence of events to the ones that we know now as history. And this story is presented in a fascinating article which was written back in 1938 by the historian David Williams on his namesake, David Williams of Wang Lod near Carfilly. So David Williams, the 18th century one, was educated at the dissenting academy in Carmarthen but of course moved theologically towards deism and actually set up a, a deist place of worship in London. By the 1780s, though, he was increasingly occupied with the theory and practice of education, delivering lectures from Russell Square. And it seems here that he got into contact with a wholesale tea merchant called James Tilly Matthews. He is my tutor, said Matthews later of Williams. And as all mankind know his staunch Republican principles, it cannot be wondered that I should possess the same principles. Now, Williams's involvement with some of the key players in the French Revolution also begins at this period when he met the journalist uh, Jacques-Pierre Brissot, who was at the time trying to set up 
uh, a kind of lycée in London. Brissot went back to Paris, continued to correspond with Williams, drew heavily on his educational theories, with the result that David Williams is better known in France than he is in Britain. By 1789, Brissot was among the leaders of the new France. He was a member of the National Assembly, a founder member of the, the Club des Jacobins. And in August 1792, Williams was included with Payne and Priestley amongst the honorary French citizens. November 1792, Williams was formally invited over to help a committee who were drafting a new constitution for the Republic. And when he went, James Tilly Matthews went too. The timing of this trip was awful. Brissot and Lebrun were now running foreign affairs not terribly well. The Republic's war against Austria and Prussia had ultimately resulted in the overthrow of the French king and his trial on December the 3rd, so David Williams is in Paris while the king is being tried, completely overshadowed the business of constitutional reform. Relations with Britain deteriorated rapidly and Brissot seems to have been simultaneously psyching the convention up for an inevitable war while still consulting Williams on the possibilities of peace. And on February the 1st, 1793, the French Convention declared war on Britain. That very same evening, apparently, Williams was asked to take a letter to Lord Grenville expressing France's extreme regret and urging that the ports of Dover and Calais would be kept open and to put another unwritten proposal to the British government, which is, if they are prepared to support the Girondists, Brissot's more moderate wing of the party in their internal power struggle against the Jacobins and help them gain control of the convention, then France would make peace and might then follow a moderate British model of parliamentary reform. So that is an absolutely pivotal moment in the history of the French Revolution. David Williams knew that his influence in Britain was nothing like what his friends in France thought. He went home delivered his letter and was frustrated but not surprised, not even to be given an audience. He never got an opportunity to pass on that peace proposal of the Girondist faction. Two months into the war, though, the French foreign minister, Lebrun, made another overture of peace, and this time the maverick ambassador was James Tilly Matthews. Matthews had spent his time in Paris using David Williams' name to get involved with French political society. And when the first peace initiative failed, he went back to France, but without David Williams' blessing, announced himself as the representative of Williams, and then proceeded to say that Britain would be prepared to negotiate if certain demands were met. He actually gave them a 13-point document with all the demands that Britain supposedly was offering. The French government took this at face value, sent him back with a sealed letter for Grenville, the British government was totally baffled by this unorthodox channel of communication, had already declared war, decided to ignore it. Over the next few months, Matthews continued to wage his rogue pacifist mission of diplomacy backwards and forwards across the channel, completely confusing both sides as to the intentions of each other. In France, the Girondist party fell, Brissot and his friends went to the guillotine, and in August 1793, Matthews was placed under arrest as a British spy, first in his hotel and then in Plessis prison near the Sorbonne. For nearly three years then, he bombarded the Committee of Public Safety with hundreds of pages of memoranda in tiny handwriting, complaining about his treatment and protesting his pacifist intentions. Uh, that one, yeah. Yeah, please. The letters are extraordinarily rem reminiscent of Yolo Morganog's voice at his most paranoid. There's the same blend of righteous indignation, of frustration, the same tendency to pile claws upon claws, to backtrack halfway through a thought, to over-explain everything. I have only claims Matthews in a very Yolo way, to utter the language of truth. If it was possible that I could for a moment deviate from the line of contact, conduct which has now for three years actuated my mind, I would long ago have turned imposter. But no, citizens, it is not in my soul. And on and on and on. Hundreds of letters. One passage in particular throws some light on Matthews's origins and sense of identity. His mother was apparently of French descent, 
but here he defends his integrity in terms of his birthright as a Welshman. If the example of one's ancestors is of any weight, or if the principles of a nation are of any proof, mine claim the preference to all others. I am Welsh, though English by being subject of Great Britain. From the time of Caesar to this moment, we have preserved our liberty and laws. History cannot furnish 100 instances in this period of a man having forsaken the cause for which you are now fighting. I say, if obstinacy of principle is of any weight, the Welsh have the preference over all mankind. <laughs> the idea of a Welsh past clearly mattered to this man. The narrative of that past is presented as one of resistance to external military power and of the preservation of cultural integrity, our liberty, our laws. The Welsh nation itself is principled, even obstinately so, and its values are the values of the new France. So it's this Welshness, coupled with his mother's French blood, which become Matthews's pledge of Republican authenticity. Many prisoners in Plessy were executed, but it seems that even French bureaucracy was no match for the relentless drip drip of Matthew's memoranda. And in February 1796, he was released on grounds of insanity and given a passport and he begged his way home. And for our purposes today, that is the end of his story, but it's actually only now that the events for which he's most famous began. Matthews came to believe that the heirloom gang, a group of criminals led by Bill the King and the Glove Woman, with extraordinary powers, were controlling his mind and the minds of others, notably government ministers, from an underground base in Moorfields. The heirloom was a kind of influencing machine which channeled thought waves and caused its victims to lie. Armed with this explanation for the otherwise inexplicable conduct of government ministers who seemed hell-bent on war when peace was offered them, Matthews continued to plague the government, dramatically accusing Lord Liverpool of treason from the gallery of the House of Commons. The result, brutally, was his committal to Bethlehem Lunatic Asylum, where the would-be champion of liberty would spend the rest of his life incarcerated. And I thoroughly recommend Mike Joe's account of this period, The Heirloom Gang. To conclude, then, we're getting to 1798. In May 1798, the Welsh naval surgeon, David Samwell, David the Vethig, who was a much-traveled man, he had been with Captain Cook and wrote an account of Cook's death, in fact, was settling into his new apartment in Versailles, where he was tending to the British prisoners of war. The conditions of the seven or 800 prisoners held at the camp, he notes, were not too bad. Indeed, as I do not relish French cooking, he rather envies them their plain mess food. But Versailles pleases him. The palace and gardens I shall not attempt to describe, but only say that they are always open to the public, of course, to a Welshman who, like me, chooses, by the by, it's Hobson's choice, to wear the French national cockade instead of his own, the leek. Perhaps you will say for once, I am a prudent man in so doing. Mm, no such thing. Everybody in France is obliged to put it in his hat or be obliged by the sentries. In short, not a single person is to be seen without it. Carrying that mark about me, I pass in the crowd without anyone knowing or caring what country I am of and find myself, as I expected, as much at ease and freedom here as in England. Back in the summer of 1789, George Cadogan Morgan had also swiftly adopted the French national cockade, which people were actually flogging to tourists um, in Paris by July 89, fabulous, uh, as a passport to ease and freedom. But back then, though, it had seemed like a gesture of solidarity with the people of France, who, like Richard Price, saw the principles of the revolution as transnational. In Paris, Restrictions on foreigners did ease after the terror, but a culture of surveillance and superstition, uh, super suspicion persisted. So wearing the cockade is Hobson's choice. Its purpose here is to disguise foreignness, not to celebrate it, and to allow even the Welshest of Welshmen, which Samuel undoubtedly was, to pass for a citizen, not of the world, but of France. <laughs> 